I'd like uh, to thank everybody for, for coming today for this lunch talk, our author's talk with uh, Margaret Wertheim. Um, Margaret is the director of the Institute for Figuring. Um, many years ago, in her collegiate years, she studied math, physics, and computer science, but for the approximately the last three decades, she's worked as a science writer, uh, and I think she would probably call herself a science communicator, correct? I mean, in really working to connect and bring together and explore three different communities, I think, vis-a-vis -vis the sciences. One would be the community of scientific professionals uh, with you know, a, accredited uh, or degrees from accredited uh, universities attached to uh, institutions and publishing in peer-reviewed journals. And then what is sometimes called lay, lay people or the lay person uh, who think they know nothing of science uh, but in fact do things in the realm of science or procedurally uh, scientific activities every day. And also a third group of scientific enthusiasts, which are sometimes pejoratively known as uh, outsider scientists or outsider physicists, who are quite certain they know much about science and also know that much of what we know about science is wrong. Um, those are very, uh, three very interesting communities that aren't as distinct as, as we think they are. And I think much of the adventure of uh, the Institute for, for Figuring and, and Margaret's uh, project overall has been to unsettle what we know about science and get us to rethink uh, what science is. So very happy to have her today to talk about the Institute for Figuring and uh, many of its programs. Well, th thank you for inviting me, Max. It's a real delight to be here. As um, Max said, I studied computer science many years ago. And um, I think back then we could only imagine the kind of possibilities that you guys are actually bringing into being right now. So um, it's really fantastic to see the possibilities that have been realized by this new science just even in my lifetime. There are lots of ways to talk about what I do. Max specifically asked me if I would make some remarks about the angle of my work, which is about trying to communicate science and mathematics to much more diverse audiences. And you know, I raise this as an issue because a lot of people don't actually realize that a lot of science communication doesn't actually reach a very diverse audience. Um, some years ago, I was invited to give a talk on, on this subject, and I did all the research looking at the top 10 science magazines in America and who actually reads them and buys them. And the, in a nutshell, the facts are like this. About three quarters of the people who read science magazines are well-educated, white, over 35, and male. Now, I've been a science communicator and science writer now for close to 30 years, and I'd always had an instinctive understanding of this, but it wasn't until I actually looked at the facts and then gathered all the statistics that the full frontal um, sort of power of this fact came through to me. And so the question that's really propelled my career as a science communicator is how can we reach a diversity of audiences along with that group of people how can we also reach women, minorities, younger adults, teens, and kids? And I think part of understanding how we can communicate better about science means literally understanding who our audience is. One of the things I like to say to people is that when we talk about science communication, a lot of the discussion is about how can we be better transmitters? How can we understand the science more as writers and communicate communicate it better or transmit it better. But in order to be a good communication network, as you guys all know, communication is a two-way street. It involves not only transmission, but reception. It has, people have to have the receiving packages, as it were. And that's the bit of science communication that's never really talked about, even in science communication forums. We don't really spend much time considering who the audience is how they might be engaged, what their needs are, and what actually their um, methodologies of interest are. And so a lot of my work has been driven by trying to understand and ask that question. Who are the people we're trying to communicate to? And how can we actually engage them in ways 
that are appealing to them. And I think this is actually a very different way of looking at the issue. It's not just how can we serve the science audience who are already engaged and doing the wonderful science, but how can we serve the rest of the public, many of whom, in my experience, really do want to be engaged, but are basically um, not ever going to have a subscription to Scientific American or Discover. They're the 99% of people who say they picked up a brief history of time and couldn't get past chapter one. And some of you might have had that experience. But so I think we really need to spend some time, if we care about science communication, we care about scientific literacy, actually really trying to think through how to communicate to a wider diversity of audiences. So my, that is what I've been thinking about for a very long time. And one way that I've come to is that I think that we can present science in a much more dynamic and interesting way by looking at it within a wider cultural context. And one of the things that means, I think, is not just sort of presenting the facts and the discoveries of science, but also its sheer beauty and poetry. When I was at university studying science and mathematics, we were all there basically because we loved it. We thought it was beautiful. Very few of us were actually thinking of doing applied things. We just loved it for the sheer beauty of it. And I think that this is an aspect of science that's not sufficiently um, available to the general public. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about a couple of the things that I have done throughout the years. One thing that I've done that I feel immensely proud of is for 10 years in my native Australia, I wrote regular monthly columns about science and technology for women's magazines like Vogue and Elle. I think this is probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's harder to write about cosmology or bioremediation for Vogue than it is to write for the New York Times. Because when you write for the New York Times, you can assume a fairly literate audience. When you write for Vogue, as has happened to me, there'll be my article about cosmology here and an, art, a, an ad on the other page about cosmetics. Mm -hmm. And how do you engage and keep people engaged when they want to know about the latest trends in skirt lengths or you know, high heel shoes, but you also want them to read about things like the Big Bang Theory and evolution. It's quite a challenge to do this, and I feel immensely proud of it. To my knowledge, I'm the only person in the world who can say they ever have run a regular column in a science, a regular science column in a women's magazine. But one of the reasons I did this is because if you look at the readership of women's magazines, they outstrip, uh, women's magazines are bought, There's, there are 17 million women's magazines, just the top 10 women's magazines sold each month in America, and 70 million people a month read them. There are only about one and a half million science magazines sold, and very few women read them. So my philosophy here was if we're serious about communicating science to women, instead of demanding the women all come to us and get a, get a subscription to Scientific American, let's go to where they are. I, I thought about it as my missionary work. Another thing I did in Australia just before moving to the US is I spent a couple of years making a six-part television science series called Catalyst that was aimed at teenage girls. And the reason for doing this series was the same reason that we have people talking about a need to engage girls in middle school here in the US because in the middle school period is the time when girls drop out of science. And, and, and I know to Google's immense credit that you are launching programs, particularly to engage girls with computer science in middle school, and I think that's brilliant. In my efforts to uh, link, to embed science in a wider cultural context, I write books on the cultural history of physics. And for me, beginning to write these books after studying um, formally in, in, for six years studying university Science, studying science in a university, it was kind of a revelation to me when I started to write books to, to understand how science related to the wider cultural landscape. And the book that I'm most well known for is called The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace. But the real name of the book is its subtitle, A History of Space from Dante to the Internet. And what the book does is it traces our um, evolving understanding of space with the dawn of the scientific revolution in the 16th century, then on through the Newtonian revolution, then the Einsteinian revolution, and now we have hyperspace theories and string theories, all of these different conceptions of space. 
And what I became interested in was how do these conceptions of space relate to wider ideas in our culture, ideas in philosophy, in theology, and in the arts. And it kind of blew my mind when I was um, researching this book how much intersection there has been historically with scientific thinking about space and wider, wider philosophical, theological, and artistic currents. It really um, is an amazing story that I think needs to be wide, more widely understood. And it's this interest in space that ultimately led to the work that I'm going to talk to you about um, in a minute. It's my more current work. But I'll just mention my, the, the book that I've most recently had out, because I believe this is the one that Max has ordered for your store. My most recent book is called Physics on the Fringe. And it's basically a look at what I call outside of physicists, people who have little or no training in science, but spend their time dreaming up alternative theories of particle physics, cosmology, and indeed the entirety of theories. Of, they have their own theories of everything. That's worthy of a talk in and of itself. And so I don't want to sort of linger on that today. But apparently, you're going to receive copies of that for those who'd like. But I'd like to come back to my thinking about space, because it was when I was writing this book, looking at how physicists in the early scientific revolution had come to the modern conception of space, the idea that space is a Euclidean void that can be described by mathematics. This seems natural to us now, but in fact, it was a revolutionary idea. And there was actually, in historically, there was a great deal of opposition to it. And in fact, it was artists. with artists who, who were trained in perspectival representation, who basically first imagined this mathematical conception of space, which later was adopted by physicists and then, then led to the great revolutions of Galileo and Newton and on to Einstein, etc. So while I was thinking, while I was researching this book, I came to see that there were deep resonances between art and science historically, resonances that had largely been forgotten. And I began to think about science differently and thought, can we re-inject that kind of um, symbiotic thinking between the arts and sciences to engage people with science in new ways? And as I was nearing the end of writing this book, I came across this amazing quote by a Welsh writer, Merrily Harper. And she said, the duty of artists everywhere is to enchant the conceptual landscape. And I love this quote because I think it, it suggests that art is not tied to any medium, but in some sense to an ethical and moral and aesthetic responsibility. And it occurred to me that this could be applied to science also. I don't know if it's the duty of scientists and mathematicians to enchant our conceptual landscape, but it is in fact one of the things that science and mathematics do. Science, for those of us who love science, particularly I think in the mathematical sciences, we are enchanted. That's why we do it. Yes, it can change the world by introducing new technologies, but it's the sheer beauty of the ideas that engage us. And so I wanted to sort of bring forth the idea of science as a resource for conceptual enchantment and to have a framework for presenting things, events, workshops, lectures, exhibitions, about the poetic dimensions of science, technology, and mathematics. And so about nine years ago, I decided to start an organization of my own to do this. It's called the Institute for Figuring, and we're based in Los Angeles. And I really saw it as an outgrowth of my work as a science writer, as a science communicator, to say, how can we reach more diverse audiences by focusing on the beauty and poetry in science and math? One way we think of ourselves at the IFF as a play tank and I think that's a term that might resonate with you guys. Google seems to me to be a bit of a play tank also. And the term comes from, it's a sort of uh, related to the idea of a think tank. You know, we have these think tanks in our society where people go and think great ideas and they write books and write opinion pieces and, pieces and try to sort of engage people with ideas through, you know, formal written texts. But my sister who formed the IFF with me and I, we believe that people can also engage with ideas through play, by methodologies, playful practices like cutting and folding paper and making things with weaving bamboo sticks together, sort of kindergarten-like practices. So we now have an exhibition space of our own in Chinatown, 
just near the Chunking Road Art District, and we invite you to come and visit us. Practically speaking, what we do is we have a very large website, we put on exhibitions, we put on lectures and workshops, and we publish small books about mathematical and scientific themes. But what we're most known for now, and what we've been engaged with for the last five or six years pretty much full time, is doing large scale participatory projects that engage hundreds and if not thousands of people in these kinds of practices. Our most, the project we're most well known for is the Crochet Coral Reef Project. We're literally crocheting a coral reef. And it is now the biggest participatory science and art project on the planet. More than 7,000 people around the world have been doing this with us for the last, it's almost eight years now. And it's really a project, uh, it, we've, been, we, we've shown it all over the world in art museums, so art galleries and science museums, such as the, Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., and the Haywood Gallery in London, which is one of the most important art galleries in the world. And it's a project that really fuses art and craft with science, marine biology, mathematics, and ecological consciousness. One of the whole points of doing this project is to highlight the fact that coral reefs the world over are being devastated by global warming and they're dying out. It's conceivable, scientists are now saying, that the CO2 problem in the atmosphere is getting so bad and so much of the CO2 is being absorbed into the oceans and warming it and acidifying it that it is possible that within our lifetimes, perhaps by um, as early as 2030, that coral reefs may stop growing altogether. So the project is an artistic response to the most critical environmental crisis on our planet. It's proof that the devastation of living reefs is proof that corals, uh, sorry, that global warming is here and now. It's not in the future, it's here and now. We've lost 70% of um, uh, Caribbean reefs in the last 30 years, and a third of the Great Barrier Reef has also been devastated. So this is really um, a critical time for corals. And if we can't change our practices about CO2, these so they are the most diverse um, ecosystems on the planet and they may literally die out in our lifetime. Now, those, some of you are probably sitting there thinking, well, that's nice, you're combining art and science, you're making a coral reef, but why on earth are you doing it in wool? What is the point of doing, doing a crochet reef? Why not chisel it in stone, carve it in marble, paint it? But there is a logically necessary reason why we are doing it in crochet. And that's because all these frilly crenellated forms that you see here, they are crochet invocations of a kind of geometry called hyperbolic geometry. And that is the geometry that is naturally realized in a lot of um, coral reef organisms, like sponges and kelps and corals that you see here. Um, so these, are, these are, are all sponges and corals. And you see these swooping crenellated hyperbolic forms. They also show up in other creatures like nudibranchs and kelps. So nature has been um, manifesting these hyperbolic structures very widely in the marine world for hundreds of millions of years. But it turns out that it's difficult for humans to make models of this. And indeed, for a long time, mathematicians thought you couldn't have models of it. But then in 1997, a mathematician at Cornell, Dr. Dinah Taimina, discovered that, in fact, you could make models of hyperbolic geometry with crochet. And I'd like to show you some of them. Pass those around and you can look at them. So these ones are all mathematically um, precise models. So they, they are actually, um, you could use those for teaching hyperbolic geometry at a university course. And in fact, um, Dr. Tamina and her husband, David Henderson, who is a great um, geometer, they indeed do teach, use these models to teach um, non-Euclidean <laughs> geometry at the university level. And you can also stitch theorems onto the surfaces of these and understand the different ways that, ge that things like parallel lines and triangles and other geometric forms behave in hyperbolic space, which is different to the way they behave in Euclidean space. So these are powerful teaching tools. And um, 
it so happens that this is what nature has been realizing in a lot of coral reef biology. So very briefly, what, so the project of the Crochet Coral Reef is really not only about producing a beautiful art object that responds to environmental warming, to global warming and the environmental crisis of the sea, it's also a way to teach people geometry. And three million people have been to these exhibitions that we've had. And in every exhibition, whether it's in an art gallery or a science museum, we have um, information about the hyperbolic geometry. And so it's been a way to do what's called informal science education, to expose three million people to geometric learning. And that is something that I feel extraordinarily pr proud of. And by the time when we give workshops and talks on this, we, d we do actually do quite a bit of geometry. And it's amazing how sophisticated people's understanding of it can be by the end of this. And it's proof that actually people are capable of learning and understanding a lot more mathematics than either they usually give themselves credit for or society gives them credit for. So I'm just going to tell you very, very briefly, some of you probably already know this, but for those of you who don't, you'll pick it up quickly. What is hyperbolic geometry or hyperbolic space? Well, it's an alternative to the two kinds of geometries you're already very familiar with, Euclidean geometry or Euclidean space and spherical space. Now, there are lots of ways of characterizing these spaces, but one way is to, say, is to look at the curvature of them. So Euclidean space is a flat space. Spherical space, think of the, the, just the surface of a sphere like a beach ball, is positive space, it's curved space that wraps around on itself. And hyperbolic space is the opposite. It's space that, it's negatively curved space, it curves away from itself. So it's the geometric equivalent of the negative numbers. And that's a really beautiful thing. Just as there is zero positive numbers and negative numbers, so it turns out there is zero curvature, positive curvature, and negative curvature space. That discovery introduced a revolution in mathematics and ultimately led to the field of non-Euclidean geometry, which is the mathematics that underlies general relativity. So the, the discovery of hyperbolic space ultimately led not only to a transformation in the whole foundation of mathematics, but also to radical discoveries. Uh, it made possible radical discoveries in physics that would come a century later with Einstein. But one way you can represent these spaces, is, you can represent hyperbolic space, is with these, these beautiful paper models that you'll see in the exhibition outside. Um, but these paper models are difficult to make. And as I said, um, they're, and they're not really completely true models. They're sort of, they're great, but they're not entirely accurate. But Crochet is by far the best way to do it. And in the process of doing this project, we have done it all over the world, in countries and cities on five continents. We've, from New York to Chicago, Sydney, Melbourne, Latvia, Germany, and we're just starting the process now of doing it in Abu Dhabi in the Middle East. And hundreds and thousands of people get involved in these projects and produce vast woolen reefs of their own in the process learning about ecological devastation and mathematics. I have to put in an outrageous product placement here. We have long dreamed of doing a book about the Crochet Coral Reef project, and we in fact have a Kickstarter campaign going on now, so I hope some of you might be interested in spreading the word, or perhaps basically we're offering the opportunity for people to pre-buy the book. The IFF's interest in mathematics and material play also extends to other subjects. And the other big subject I want to talk to you about today, uh, just in my remaining minutes, is another project that we've been doing over the last two years, which is engaging people in the mathematics of fractals by folding business cards. So you can basically take a standard American size business card, which is two inches by three and a half inches, and fold it into cubes. And the cubes can be linked together to make these fantastical sort of architectural structures. And last year, I spearheaded a project at USC to build a giant model of a, a fractal known as the Mosley Snowflake Sponge out of 50,000 business cards. 
The project um, was dreamed up by an engineer, Dr. Janine Mosley, who is an MIT trained engineer, in fact, computer scientist. And she dreamed up this thing called business, this technique called business card origami in order to make giant models of fractals. And over nine months last year at USC, we had uh, hundreds of students all over USC spend over 3,000 hours um, building components and assembling them into these giant, into this giant structure. And we can talk more in the question time if you like about exactly what fractals are, but I'm sure you guys are probably fairly familiar with them. So this was the first and only time this object has been assembled. It actually turned out to be a lot more difficult engineering challenge than we imagined, but we finally did it. And it was on display at USC uh, until very recently. In the process of doing that, I became really fascinated with Dr. Janine's, Dr. Mo, Janine Mosley's folding techniques. And I came to wonder, what if you just had a bunch of fabulously beautiful business cards and allowed people to fold, to do these techniques? Are there other structures that are possible? Fractals are one thing, but they're very, it's, it's a very kind of rigid process to make them. You have to make a lot of little units that are all identical and link them together till you get the whole object, which is you know, similar to itself on every scale. And it's a very rigorous, you know, precise engineering exercise to do that. And I wondered, what if you just let people play? What could they produce? What, are there other kinds of mathematically inflected objects that might be possible? So I was conceiving this as a kind of exercise at the interface of mathematics making and just free form play. And it, we specially designed 60,000 business cards and got them printed up. And we held workshops uh, over the course of the first six months of the beginning of this year. And we just invited people to come and attend the workshops and learn the techniques. And lots of people came and they started playing. And first of all, we just sort of made interesting new color variants on Dr. Mosley's fractals. But then people started to invent new ways of folding, new ways of linking cubes. And they even produced off-kilter things, like this fabulous way of folding tetrahedrons that was developed by Jake Dodson. And people like Jake started to make really interesting off-kilter, different kind of structures that, were, again, were algorithmic and rigorous in their construction, but just used a whole variety of new folding techniques for instance, to be able to make things go at angles and to produce um, you know, vertices in these new off-kilter, non-rectilinear fashions. So uh, that is a lot of the work that you see on display in the Google, um, in the exhibition space down the hallway, that what you see in that exhibition is a, a number of the models that we, we and our contributors like Jake made during the course of the exhibition. Jake also... Um, is we, that exhibition finished at the IFF a, month, a couple of months ago. And n currently, we have another exhibition on in which, in fact, Jake is building a different kind of geometric structures out of thousands of bamboo sticks folded, uh, sorry, woven together and linked into these huge networks of platonic solids. So Jake calls himself a liberation geometer. And what he's interested in is how can you use geometry as a kind of playful tool which will lead to not only beautiful forms but ultimately hopefully forms that could be realized at an architectural scale. So now if you visit the IFF we're building things out of thousands of these fabulously um, dyed bamboo sticks in hundreds of beautiful colors and again we're having workshops to teach people the basic techniques to turn these sticks into networks of tetrahedrons and octahedrons and cubes, and then how can you build them up to make giant articulated structures? So again, this is an exercise where what we're doing is engaging people in what I like to think of as a kind of applied experimental mathematics. We all think about mathematics as something that we usually engage with through purely symbolic means by reading textbooks and learning equations. But you can also engage with mathematical ideas, at least some mathematical ideas, by playful methods of materially embodied practices. 
and that in itself constitutes a rich form of learning. And we hope that many of you might visit us at the IFF, and if you want to check us out more, we're available online. So thank you very much, and let me open the floor to questions, comments, anything you feel moved to say. Uh, you certainly got oh, uh, you certainly got the idea behind the visual aesthetics of mathematics down. Yes. Um, I'm interested in what your perspective is on communicating the kind of more abstract aesthetic uh, qualities of say a group of people and high numbers or various geometric you know, groups of uh, right. you know, how do you do you have any plans on how to communicate kind of that I think of some of um, I have, I would love to, I have a lot of mathematical subjects that I'd love to do shows and exhibitions and events about. Um, and I think each particular topic uh, needs to have its own methodologies, if you like. So, I mean, let me tell you about one topic we've done that was a much more, ab in some ways, a much more abstract topic that's been very successful. We've done um, a number of events on the subject of knot theory. And we've had one of the world's great knot mathematicians, Dr. Ken Millett from UC Santa Barbara, come and do events with us. And, I mean, knot theory, as you know, is an area of mathematics that is now regarded as absolutely foundational. Um, and and it, links, it links vast areas of mathematics, topology, geometry, and algebra. So, and, but it's evolved from one of the simplest things of all, which is just simply taking a bit of string and tying a knot in it. And in fact, Dr. Millett claims in his talk that knotting is the oldest technology known to humanity. There doesn't seem to have been any culture in the entire history of the world that hasn't invented some form of knotting because it's the first system for you know, fastening things. So fishing nets, making baskets, tying things to your clothing, all involve knots. And so this, this, this is a wonderful branch of mathematics which sort of reveals the richness and power of the subject. You can take the simplest material thing, tying a bit of string, and, and ultimately it leads to what we now understand, it, it, knot theory links these vast areas of mathematics in ways that are not understood. We do not understand how the algebraic aspects of, of knot theory relate to the topological aspects, but they are there. And it is a foundational question in mathematics, how to do that. So that is, I think that sort of answers your question, that I believe that you can take these, sub, these very highly complex subjects and find ways in. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone who comes to our events is going to pass a university exam. They're not. But they're going to understand a great deal more than they understood when they walked in the door. Uh, do you think that there's a way to uh, inject the uh, beautiful uh, crocheted fabric um, that's hyperbolic into fashion? <laughs> and, uh, you know, sort of use that as a, as a sort of foot in the door for discussing that in the uh, more heavily read by women magazines and stuff like that. To answer your question very specifically, there is a guy um, at the University of Technology, Sydney, who is doing his, um, P I, think, I can't remember if he's doing a PhD or a master's thesis on this very topic. So he, he's a... Um, He's a fashion design student, but has a very, very good spatial sense. And his fashion is about trying to incorporate non-Euclidean surfaces into his fashion. So he's learning very elaborate and, and, and pioneering very elaborate means of pattern cutting that ena enable him to sew and non-Euclidean surfaces. And we he's been in contact with us, and you know he. One of the things that he wants to do is to have hyperbolic surfaces in fashion. And, and indeed, I don't actually have it on this PowerPoint here, but I, there have in fact been, um, there, there in fact is naturally hyperbolic surfaces in fashion because um, 
peasants, uh, ballerina skirts, where they're very fluty and frilly. They actually make them from taking um, a lot of uh, circular strips and, and sewing them together so you get a very, very frilly, fluted surface. And peasant, uh, some peasant dancing skirts are like that. And they actually are hyperbolic surfaces, but the women, nobody realised they'd been doing it. And also anyone, people have been, women have been crocheting ruffled, Late, uh, basically hyperbolic ruffles for hundreds of years and those, there are lots of techniques in, in knitting, tatting and crochet to do this and people have been doing it without realising that they were mathematical surfaces. Margaret, it's, it's interesting to me that a, a lot of what you do with the IFF was more common as a pedagogical approach in like the 19th century and early 20th century. You know, you, you think even today, like Waldorf schools and Montessori have much more embodied learning like this, and you go back to maybe Elizabeth Mayo and her uh, teaching through objects, like object lessons. And now there's this sort of movement to get a lot of technology in the schools, and everybody has iPads and stuff, but, <laughs> but we're moving away from that, that form of embodied learning. And I, I was wondering if you could speak to kind of the, the tension of the, between these two approaches and how we might somehow integrate them. Yes, I, I think that's a very important point that you're making, Max. And in fact, all of those um, embodied learning methods like Montessori and Waldorf and Steiner schools, um, they actually have a predecessor. And the predecessor is Friedrich Froebel. Froebel um, was a mid-19th century German crystallographer. And he invented... The, the concept of kindergarten. So you and I, we all went to kindergarten. But the kindergarten that we experienced was a very watered down version of what in the mid 19th century was a very formalized system of education that was developed by this man, Friedrich Froebel, based on his, um, the science of, Christ of crystallography, which was all about understanding the geometric structures beneath crystal, you know, minerals. And Froebel believed that little children should be introduced to the most abstract geometric ideas as young as possible. And he did it by having them do these formal exercises where they would make things out of sticks. Just literally, they were doing this sort of thing, making geometric structures out of sticks and blocks and weaving paper strips together and other material practices. And the Freudian education system, which only existed from about 1860 to about 1910, was a very rigorous learning system, all based on geometry. And it revolutionized modern thinking. Because one, there's a very interesting book written about kindergarten called Inventing Kindergarten by a man named Norman Prosterman. And he claims that the two generations of children who went through Freud in kindergarten and did all these playful material exercises which were basically mathematical in nature, they are the people who went on to found modern art. People like Clay, Paul Clay and Kandinsky and Frank Lloyd Wright, they had Freud in kindergarten in their childhood. And, and Norman's claim is that where they got modernist aesthetics from was from doing these exercises with blocks and strings and sticks as little children. And it's a very profound thesis. And I think when you see his book and read it, it's convincing argument. It's also the case that the founders of modern physics are the right age and generation to, and lived in the right part of the world, Germany, to have gone to Freudian kindergartens too. Richard Feynman said point blank at one point in, in an interview that that is where he got it from. He had some experience with Freud Belly and kindergarten practices as a child. His father taught it to them. And he claimed that that's what made him be a physicist and enabled him to then have this pictorial spatial idea about physics later on that he's so famous for. So I believe that we need Freud Bell, Freud Belly and learning ideas back. And in fact, at the IFF, we regard ourselves as Freud Belly and kindergarten for grown ups. And, and I completely agree. I think it's wonderful that children can do all this stuff with computers and computer games can be profoundly helpful in all sorts of ways. But I also think that these embodied practices are absolutely critical. Any more questions? Yes. Um, you spoke earlier about the, you spoke earlier about the, the 
spoke earlier about uh, kind of the not bad things that we do with franchise groups. Mm-hmm. Um, and while most of those things are really, um, one of them that I'm somewhat surprised at is uh, the, what you said, uh, the minorities are not really categorized right now. And I'm curious, is that just because of the general um, or education uh, distribution um, to you know, minorities, or is there something Um, I haven't really looked into that question, so I, I can't really comment on it. Um, I mean, my my feeling is that it's probably part of the general difficulties of getting minorities into mathematics and science. Um, I don't know specifically if anyone's done research on why they don't read science magazines or how to get science magazines to them, but I know it's it's a it's a huge fact that that they don't, um, and and I think it, I was listening to NPR the other day and they had a segment on um, a society of uh, it's called Blacks in Technology, and the the guy I can't remember if he worked he, he didn't work at Google but it was one of the other big tech companies, and you know he was talking about founding this society because he said. You know, the problem is not that there are black kids who might not be interested in going into technology, but they don't get the encouragement, they don't get the mentoring, they face they face a lot of peer pressure to do other things like you know hang out and do drugs, and that the goal of this society was to you know take those kids and and young students at universities and colleges, and 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 encourage and them in their interest. So his claim was that it's not that they're not they're not kids and young people out there who are interested, but how do we retain them? And I don't know if Google has any projects um, in that line, but I imagine it would be very fruitful to do so. Can I ask you guys, so, did, did many of you feel like you had a love of math and science when you were really little, or did it come to you later? That, that's my general impression of the, you know the people I know who are in the computer science world is that that love and passion for these kind of algorithmic things comes pretty early, and 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 it's it's a thing that children are incredibly facile with, and how can you know part of the thing that I why I believe this is important is I actually think that all people are naturally gifted at mathematics. Mathematics is a language, it's the language of pattern and form. Human beings, this is the most fabulous pattern recognition system on the planet. And why is it that we lose, we lose that ability? We're all born with it. And people like you are proof of what can, you know, Google is a proof of what can be achieved with that power. What are we missing out on by having so few people in our society retain that interest and love? And, and I, I think that's why this matters, is that we are squandering the potential of 99% of our population. I mean, the number of people who come up to me and say, you know, I always wanted to be good at math, and it, I thought I was when I was really little, and then something happened, usually around middle school, and I couldn't do it anymore, or I was told I couldn't do it anymore. But when they come and do these kind of activities at our workshops and events, they get really engaged and enthused because it's proof to them that they actually do have a mathematical mind. And one of the biggest comments we get from people in the Crochet Coral Reef project is how critically important it is to them, and most of these people are women, that, they, that in the course of doing a, a handicraft, which, which they feel is both beautiful and comfortable and pleasurable to them, that at the same time as that, they're being taught about non-Euclidean geometry and shown some insight into the mathematics that is going to lead us to understand space and time. They're, in, they're doing something embodied, but their minds are being engaged, and they're being shown not just that they can do something beautiful with their hands, but that their minds are actually capable of comprehending these extraordinary ideas. And that's what propels me as a science communicator, and that's what why I do the IFF is because I love maths and science. 
I want other people to be able to love it and to enjoy the sheer pleasure of understanding something like hyperbolic geometry. It's just drop dead wonderful thing. And why is it that our society has not been able to, has not only not been able to retain so many people in these fields, but in some sense actively expelling them? And we could have, you know, my view is if we did better with math and science communication and math and science education, we could have 10 Googles on planet Earth, and wouldn't that be wonderful? Look what one Google has achieved. What could 10 of them do? Maybe we'd actually get to Alpha Centauri, not just Mars. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, when, when we convinced uh, Thomas and others to, to dedicate a certain part of the campus to uh, an exhibition space. It was, it was precisely um, institutions like the Institute for Figuring that, that I know I had in mind. There's a long tradition of, of alter alternative organizations in Los Angeles, like the Museum of Jurassic Technology and the Center for Land Use Interpretation. Um, and even before then, like the Hughes Workshop that brought mm. industry, science, and art together. And I think it, it it, it results in sort of a, a holistic communication of, of, of principles in a very interesting way. So thank you very much for coming, and thanks for helping us organize the exhibit here, and, and very happy that you came today. Mm. My pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. Matt.